770. What I would like to do is have uh, uh, Tony, you're coming on up, and then I think the stewards, are you all coming up as well? Are y'all going to help us? Are y'all helping us this morning? Or is it just Tony? Tony, is it just you, man? It's just you right now. <laughs> all right, George is going to come up and help him. And so what, what they have done, what we would like to do first is so preschool all the way up to fifth grade. If you're in pre preschool up to fifth grade, you just come on up because we, we've got school supplies for you. We've got some other stuff for you that, that is in, are in these bags. So come on up. Come on up. All right. All right. Go ahead. Hey, just y'all can grab one out of there. This is for you all. We appreciate you all being at church. Appreciate you all being part of the church family. Man. Great looking group of kids here. Man, wonderful, wonderful. We've got more in the bag over here. So if we were to run out here, if we were to run out here, we've got more over there. Come over here, 
Eat away. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, all right. Now, if somebody else were to come in here in just a little bit, we've still got these, so, so make sure you remind them, tell them where those are at. We will get them to them. So now, if middle school through high school, middle school through high school, we've got you all stuff in here. We've got sippy cups and everything. I'm just joking. Come on. Come on. We've got it here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Come on up. Come on up. Hey, look at this group of teens, right? Man, excellent. Excellent. Man, love that. Love that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Man. Well, they, are they just coming on up? The ones that are going to camp, you all come on up here. Y'all can't escape. Y'all can't escape. So, sorry. So, Amanda, if you come on up. What, where is Diane at? Where are you at? Raise your hand. There you are. Hey, come on up here. Come on up here. All right. So, so when they're done, we're actually, this is, this is going to take just a little bit of time here, but we're going to pray for them, but then we're going to have the, t the kids come up that went to children's camp last week. We want them to share with you some of the experiences they had as well. And so what we would like to do is we just want you all where you're at. Would you just stand up right now? We're going to pray for them. We're going to pray. We want God to move in a mighty way this week. Uh, we, we don't want them to come back the same way they left. We want God to fill them like never before through the power of his Holy Spirit. So let's just pray this morning over our teens. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you are doing in these teens, in the, in the teen group. We thank you, Lord, that uh, they are part of the church and the body of Christ. Thank you for every teen that is here, that is represented. And so we pray, Lord, would you just continue to pour your spirit out. Lord, this week as they go to church camp, we ask, would you speak to them? Lord, would they be willing just to allow you to move in their lives like never before? Lord, would you call them into that deeper walk with you? Would you open Open up doors that they thought would never be open. And so, Lord, we ask, would you touch in a mighty way? Lord, uh, we pray for Amanda and Diane as, as they will be with them. We ask, Lord, would you touch them? Would you strengthen them and bless them? Thank you, Lord, for the time that they are putting in to these teens' lives. And so, Lord, we pray, would you touch them in a mighty way? We love you so much for all that you are doing. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you all. Thank you all. Y'all may be seated. Hey, kids, real quick, the, the, I think there was three of them that went to uh, children's camp. Is that correct? Would you all come up? All right. Come on up here. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to use one of these real quick. All right. Okay, all right, so these three, don't, don't back back. No, you got to come out in the front. So. All right, so these three were able to go to children's camp down in Tennessee uh, for church camp for the district, and, man, they had a great time. And so I, I just want you all just to tell a little bit about it. Uh, what, what was uh, the most fun thing that you all got to do? And then just share with what God maybe did in your life while you were there. All right? You want to start? I'll let you hold it. You take it. I made no, I made no friends, and I got to play in awesome. the creek with them. Ah, playing in the creek. You got to love that, right? So everybody loves the creek down there. Anything else? Uh, did, did God help you while you were down there, man? Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord, brother. Praise the Lord. He's good. He's good. Parker, what'd you enjoy, man? I enjoyed chapel, and my favorite service that uh, Pastor Pete did was, I want more of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And the best part is about the whole entire chapel, um, and this guy came up and said, how many people, how many people just stand up if the Holy Spirit has called you to be something? I stood up and the Lord called me to be a preacher. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, wait, what, what was the fun part, Isabel? Swimming at night. Oh, I love swimming at night. Swimming at night. Well, anything else exciting for you? Playing at the creek. Oh, playing at the creek. <laughs> Love that. Did you enjoy the chapel services as well? Yes. Awesome, awesome. Pastor Pete does a great job with them. Anything else? Um, 
No? All right, all right. Well, you give them a hand clap. Thank you all for doing that. And man, a wonderful time. Wonderful time. All right, all right. Well, brother, come lead us. Come lead us. We're going to roll on. After hearing all of that, there shall be showers of blessings. Turn in your hymnals to hymn number 721. Let's sing about it. Let's all stand.
this morning I'm going to sing an old song. Um, I never heard this song until I went to visit my aunt and uncle in New Jersey just a couple months ago and fell in love with it. So y'all just listen to the words. Build my mansion next door to Jesus and tell the angels I'm coming home. It doesn't matter who lives around me. Just so my mansion sits near the throne. I have no castles, no earthly kingdoms, but my cabin will do till I get home. My mansion's yonder on the hills of glory. I hope my mansion sits near God's throne. Just build my mansion next door to Jesus. Tell the angels I'm coming home. It doesn't matter who lives around me, just so my mansion sits near the throne. My mother's mansion may be close by me across the golden avenue. She was the first one to teach me of heaven. And the very first, Lord, to tell me about you. So build my mansion next door to Jesus. And tell the angels I'm coming home. It doesn't matter who lives around me, just so my mansion sits near the throne. Just so my mansion sits near the throne. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Matthew chapter 5, still the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, man, Matthew chapter 5, after you found it, if you would, stand out of reverence of God's Word. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 2 says, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Lord Jesus, right now we ask, would you just continue to move in a mighty way? Lord, we are so thankful that you promised heaven. 
You promised all the splendor. But Lord, you promised you would be there. And so we are so grateful and thankful for that. I pray, Lord, would you help me as I preach this morning? A message that may be tough. But Lord, your word is true. So would you just touch us now this morning that we would just be obedient to what you would speak and what you say. Lord, may you hide me behind the cross. May you move me out of the way. Lord, that it's not Brother Dwayne, but Lord Jesus, it is you and you alone that is speaking. And so this morning, we trust you and we thank you and we praise you for who you are. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And we all say together, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Have you ever seen the person, whether they were an adult or a child, that was dressed in the best uniform or the best jersey, some pretty cool socks, the awesome shoes, and you look at them and you say, man, they've got to be pretty good at what they're getting ready to do. They have all the right gear. They have the right look, but then something crazy happens. The game starts, and the way that they look doesn't quite match up with the way that they play. You ever seen that? Man, I've seen a lot of that in my day. There was nothing else really to show for what they had other than the nice gear. People can look impressive, but looking impressive does not equal great performance. Did you hear that? Just wanted you to grab hold of that. Looking impressive does not equal great performance. And so this morning, I want to truly preach a message just entitled, What Is It Really? We read a lot of scripture, we read a lot of verses out of the Bible, but sometimes we don't take time to study it. We don't take time for the Lord to really speak to us. And so we just read a a scripture or a passage of scripture, and then we just keep going on. But this morning, I really want us to grab hold of something because this verse right here is very, very important. Eternity weighs on it. Did you realize that? The message, I, uh, the, the, the verse that I just read, eternity weighs in the balance of every person's life. It's going to be a tough message this morning. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? Appearance means a lot in the world that we live in, but not so much when it comes to the kingdom of God. Did you realize that? It's actually opposite of what the world says. The world says the more you have, the better it is. Jesus says little as much when I'm in it. (laughs) The world says the more that you keep, the greater it's going to be. And Jesus says, whoa, 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 you need to give it away. (laughs) Right? If you want to be part of the kingdom of God, guess what? Sometimes you just got to let go of everything else that the world has and say, I'll take what Jesus is giving. It doesn't make sense to the world, but I'm afraid that the world has slipped into the church, and nowadays it doesn't make sense to the church anymore either. And so a pastor can stand behind the pulpit and preach a message, and they will think he's absolutely gone crazy because that's what the world has said. A pastor can stand behind the pulpit and preach a message, and people will look at him and say, or look at her and say, man, what in the world are you talking about? There's there's no way that that could be true, even though the preacher preached... Out of the word of God. But because the world says, no, that's not true, we sometimes give in. Have you ever had peer pressure put on you? Uh, You ever had peer pressure? I mean, where it's just like it's constant. Somebody keeps coming, and man, it's just like they won't go away. You ever had anybody come to you five days in a row? Anybody ever had anything like that? About a week? No? 
Okay, I'm the only one. And I tell you what, that gets frustrating sometimes, right? But you know what? Satan loves peer pressure. Guess what? Teens and children are not the only ones that have peer pressure. The adults have it just as much, and I don't care how old you are. You'll have the pressure that will be tried to put up on you by Satan. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Wow. Jesus, once again, teaching the people in his sermon, talking about the heart, but to the heart. Did you get that? Jesus talks about the heart, but to the heart. And he really hones in on it. The, the word heart is used many times in the Bible. So in your Bible, depending on which translation that you have, uh, the heart is spoken of 600 to over 800 times. Did y'all get that? 600 to 800 times the heart is spoken on. And the majority of the time, it is not dealing with a physical heart, but the spiritual heart. Did you hear that? Even in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is full of scriptures about the heart, but really never dealing with the physical aspect. Dealing with the spiritual aspect of a person's heart. Did you really, did you know that really the spiritual aspect is what makes the heart beat? Oh, ah, come on. Everybody's got a heartbeat. Everybody's got a heart, right? So some of y'all are saying, man, I met some people who didn't seem like they had a heart. Man, man. Everybody's got a heart. Everybody's got a heartbeat. But when something spiritual happens in someone's heart, that's when they really begin living. That's when the heart really begins beating. That's when really everything begins to turn completely around and you see things in the way God truly created humans. Oh, man. If we were to go back into the Old Testament, we would see in Psalm 24, a psalm written by David. Man, if anybody ever knew about the heart, be a man by the name of David. In verse 3 of Psalm 24, it says this, Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Now listen, this is David speaking in the Old Testament. Can I tell you what he's really saying here? David is saying this. Who can stand before God Almighty in heaven? Who's going to be the one to truly make it? This is in the Old Testament. David begins to speak on this. Verse 4 gives us the answer in Psalm 24 and it says this. He... Who has clean hands and a pure heart. That's in the Old Testament. Man, we don't even want to think about purity of heart until we get over into the New Testament. We don't want to think about any aspect of the heart that God really ever dealt with until Jesus comes on the scene. But I want you to realize the heart has always been the heart. The heart of God has always been the heart of God. But it's also this, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. It's always been. Go back to Genesis, you will realize, man, there was a big problem with the heart. Not so much the physical, but the spiritual aspect of it. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. Jesus does come on the scene, God in the flesh, and says the thing that his father has been saying all along in verse 8 of Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see him. God's always said that. God has always dealt with the heart. God has always moved in a way that our heart would realize it long before our mind. Oh, come on. If you think that intellectually you're going to be able to understand God's work, and I tell you, it is not by the mind that you learn, it's by the heart. If the heart is not changed, the mind will never get there. Because your mind can't help you change. 
Jesus deals and God deals with the heart. That word pure here in this passage in verse 8, it's a Greek word. Katharos is that name. And that word just means this, clean. That's what it means. It means clean. It's interesting when we start talking about clean because I wonder if I were to go through starting right here and come all the way around and we were to take the definition of clean. Okay? Now here's how I'm going to take the definition of clean. Your house. What? You know why? Because everybody's got a different definition when it comes to clean when we begin to talk about the aspect of the physical, right? So what's clean to someone may not be clean to the other, right? You ever been there? Come on. But I want you to know when God begins to speak of this, you can't change his mind. What he said is what he means. And if it's anything other than what God means, then it doesn't fly. See, we can try to change. There are many people that are trying to change the word of God. And we can read a verse 8 and say, you know what? I just don't like that. I just don't like that. I think we need to change that word pure, that word clean, that katharos. We, we need to switch that word to where it almost means pure, right? We need to switch that word to where we're 99.6% is good enough for God. But can I tell you something? It's not. Oh, we uh, listen, the church wants to live that way. How pure are you? Well, I think I'm all right. Is that what God says? <laughs> you think you're all right? Can I tell I, I can't tell you how I many people I prayed with that say, and I say, hey, are you gonna make it to heaven? If you were to die right now, you know what they say? Well, I hope so. Well, I can, can I just go ahead and tell you, if that's your answer, you're in trouble. I'm just straight up with you. You're in trouble. If you don't know so, hope so ain't going to get it. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, what's going to happen is this. Well, you're just being too hard on us. Preachers getting up there and preaching on the word of God. And, man, we, what we need to be doing is we just need to move over and talk about the love of God. Well, I'm all about the love of God. But the thing about it is, it you really don't love God until you got a pure heart. Oh, come on. Oh, man. Now, oh, you're just judging. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Matthew chapter 7, judge not lest you be judged. I, I would encourage you to read the rest of that. Read all five verses. And the one that says judge not lest you be judged, can I tell you, man, it's going to be awful ugly by the time you get to that fifth verse. Because you're going to realize you missed the whole point of what Jesus is speaking on. By the way, by the way, I'm just going to jump on this for just a second. We're talking about purity of heart, right? Anybody ever talk to you about, don't you judge me? You're just judging everybody. Can I just ask you right now, if I were to go out to your vehicle, how many of you locked your doors when you got out of your vehicle this morning? At the church of the Nazarene. If I were to go out there and try to open your door, how many of you just be so honest right now to raise your hand and say, I locked my doors when I got out? Anybody do that? You bunch of judgmental people. <laughs> You're in church for heaven's sake, right? And here you are like, you know why? Because all of a sudden, man, we got to understand what truly judging is. What it's saying is this. How many of you lock your doors at night when you go to bed? Can you just slip here? You bunch of judgmental people. No, keep your doors unlocked. If we're not going to judge people, what we need to do is this. We need to look through the rose-colored glasses that everybody else does and says, you know what, I think everybody's okay. I just saw the other day an article that came out and said this. A judge released a man that was about in his 80s because he was a murderer, and they said, well, he has served his time. We're not going to give him the death penalty. We're going to let him go because he'll never do it again. When he got out, guess what he did? He killed again at 80-some years old. You know why? It's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. Judge not lest you be judged. Keep going on down just a little bit further in Matthew chapter 7. And man, Jesus really drives home. Listen to me. Now listen to me. I'm not talking about judging the world. You know why I had you raise your hands? Because the church is to judge the church. 
You say, no, it's not my job to judge the trial. I'm not going to do something. Then how do you know if somebody's living right? What are you going to do with James chapter 5, verses 19 through 20? What are you going to do with those verses? When it says that if a brother or sister sees someone wandering from the truth. Uh-oh, how can you wander from the truth unless you've got the truth? Well, come on now, let, let's, get, let's get a little bit good right here. Listen, I'm talking about purity of heart. And the problem that we can't have purity of heart is because we're afraid to call people out in what they're living in. How do we expect people to have purity of heart if we don't actually tell them what's going on in their lives? The Bible goes on to say in James chapter 5, they say, If one brings a sinner back from their ways, uh-oh, uh-oh, how do you know the truth? And wander away from it and still call yourself a child of God when James chapter 5 calls you a sinner. Oh, boy, now we're, oh, man, what in the world? That ain't very fair. I want to be once saved, always saved. I want to live the way that I want to live. I want to do the things I want to do and still call Jesus, Jesus. I'm getting ready to get in that just a little bit more here in just a second. But the aspect of it is this. If you read James chapter 5 and you can try to explain that to me in a way that says you can live how you want to and make it to heaven, I'll quit preaching. Well, that's a pretty bold statement, wasn't it? You know why? Because you can't. You can't. Because it's just plain as day. When it, now listen, you can say, well, I have went to such and such school and studied the Greek and the Hebrew. You know what I did? I read the Word of God. <laughs> I don't know what else I'm supposed to do except study the Word and let the Word speak into us. If we would do that instead of worrying about what everybody else is saying and worrying about what the Word of God says, man, we'd get a little bit further. Ah, uh, you said, oh, man, you're talking about purity. Yeah, I am talking about purity of heart. I am talking about purity of heart. He says, if our heart's not pure, how can you see God? He says, you won't. Well, I just don't like that. Well, God really don't care if you like it. Oh, come on. No, no, we're in, a, we're in Christianity. And God loves everything that's going on. No, no. He loves his people. He loves the sinner. But he hates the sin. Yeah. You know what? Right? He loves the sinner because he wants the sinner to be pure. And the only way to be pure is when you hate the sin. And you say, Lord, forgive me. Help me to live a little bit different than what I'm living right here. I need your power of your Holy Spirit living inside of me. You see, God had rules and laws in the Old Testament. People could not go in. Listen, people could not go in and make sacrifices. They couldn't bring sacrifices if things were unclean. You remember that? That's Old Testament. Go to Leviticus. Man, you can read all about that. Man, they had to be cleansed. So what they did is God gave them some laws and rituals that were instituted in the Old Testament so that they would be prepared for the time when they were going to sacrifice to God. Right? So what God was saying in the Old Testament is this. Don't bring all your junk to me like that. He says this. Hey. Come on, let's get a little bit cleaned up here, right? You're getting ready to go before God Almighty. Don't, don't go out there and get the worst of the worst animal that you have and bring it to me. Can I tell you this? If you brought the worst of the worst this morning, you put no effort into this, can I tell you, God is not pleased with that. By the way, that deals with purity of heart. Even though we don't like to think about it in that way. Can I tell you? How much do you give to God and how much do you give to your work? How much do you give to the world? How much do you give to your home? How much do you give to your family? Because can I tell you? God trumps every bit of that. Oh, come on. I oh, know. Help me, Lord. Whoo, boy. By the time Jesus came on the scene, the Pharisees had took this, Right? This old law that they had, right? The law that God instituted and said, this is what we need to do. Well, the Pharisees had grabbed a hold of it and twisted it, right? They had put it so far down that they added some of their own laws. They had to do it. Now, listen, here was the aspect of it. People were like, oh, well, they're Pharisees. We can't say anything about that, all right? They're priests. Oh, that, they should know the word. If that's what they're saying, then that's what we've got to do. And Jesus came on the scene and said, what in the world are you all doing, Pharisees? What, what are you trying to do to the people? 
They can't even worship God because what you have done is you have tied them in that. And you remember what Jesus began to say to them? You know what Jesus called the Pharisees many times? Anybody take a guess? What was it? Hypocrites. We go with vipers. They bite you too. But the whole thing of it is this. He called them hypocrites. Acting like you're something that you're not, right? So all of a sudden, here's what it was. Here we had the Pharisees walking around. You know what they were doing? Uh, 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 I'm better than you. Right? That's what Scripture says they were doing. Even at the altar. Praise the Lord, I ain't like that ugly old boy over there. <laughs> right? That's what they said. Jesus came on the scene and said, how dare you walk around like this? Because truly, this is what I'm seeing. Oh, you think you got something going on, and you got people to believe it. You got people to actually believe that you're living right, when truly, I see the heart of the problem. The heart of the problem is, you've never allowed me to do anything in your life. But yet, you walk around because you got the nice clothes on. You walk around because you put the game face on. You walk around like you really got it going on. And what people are seeing, listen to this, you know why? Because we can't see the heart. When a lot of times the heart looks like this. And we are too wrapped up in everything else. To try to say something about it, even when the heart reveals itself in the church. Uh, you do realize that the heart tells on you? You can't be a hypocrite and hide it forever. You know what the Bible says? Be sure your sins will find you out. Can I tell you, you can't walk around with the game face on, with the nice clothes that say I'm a Christian, and yet everything else be contrary to what you're saying. Eventually it's going to come out. And can I tell you, eventually there will be somebody that is bold enough through the power of the Holy Spirit to call you out on it. And for those of you all that are walking close enough to the Lord, that you are so, listen to me. If that's you this morning, and you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself, and yet you walk in here, and you see your brother or sister committing a sin not unto death, and you do not try to help them out, you're just as big a hypocrite as what they are. How can you say you love your sister or brother, and you would watch them die and go to hell? I told you it wasn't going to be an easy. Blessed are the pure in heart. Well, I just don't want to call anything out because I just want to. Can I tell you? Can I? Here we go. Honesty. That's always good, right? Woo! I've been called out before. Uh oh. Uh, you know why? Because brothers and sisters check each other. Hello? If you ain't got nobody holding you accountable, that means you do what you want to do, not what God wants to do. You say, no, all I need is just me and the Lord. <laughs> what do you do when the scripture says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together? If it's all about you and the Lord, how in the world are you leading anybody to Christ? How in the world are you making sure that your brother or sister is living the life that they need to do? You see, the whole thing of it is this. Purity of heart is more than just saying, that's what I've got. Because who cares if you fooled the pastor? Who cares if you fooled the church? Because you ain't ever going to fool God. And what happens is this. For about an hour, we can put on a good show. And for about an hour, we can resist the lump in our throat that's so deep that we, if we were to swallow, we would die probably on the spot. 
Our heart is beating about out of our chest. The pew in front of us has probably got our fingerprints in it. Well, we have grabbed a hold of it so hard. And for about an hour, we can resist that. And what we can do, we can walk out of here with the sign that says pure on it. But we're afraid to flip it over and really show what's in our lives, which is nothing but blackness. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they, stipulation, for they, who's they? The pure in heart. Those are the only ones who will see God. Ain't it? Halfway don't count it. Halfway ain't going to make it. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Jesus says, Over and over again, Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. Listen to this. Oh boy, are y'all ready? Uh, By the way, if the Lord's dealing with you now and you're upset, then it's probably a good time to leave because it ain't going to get no better. (laughs) Some of y'all think I'm joking, but what I'm saying is if you ain't ready to get real, right there's the door. (laughs) Because God ain't got time for you to waste his time. He's dealing with other people's lives. And if you won't let him deal with yours, can I tell you, you won't be dark in the doors very much longer because you cannot come into the house of the Lord where his presence is at and stay the same. I know. Matthew 15, verses 18 and 19. Listen to Jesus speaking. This ain't very nice of Jesus. I like Jesus speaking. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the... Oh, no, that wasn't good enough. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the... Yeah, that's that's what it said. Look it up. Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. Now listen to what he says right after that. It proceeds out of the heart, and this defiles a person. By the way, if you were to look up in Scripture, you will realize the Bible says no unclean thing will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Nothing unclean will enter into the kingdom. Into the kingdom of heaven. Not my words, God's words. Can't get there. Can't slip in the back door. Can't go under the gate. Can't do all that stuff. It doesn't work. Verse 19 says this in Matthew 15. For out of the heart come evil thoughts. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, Slander, oh me, oh my. (laughs) Uh, We're going to get into it just a little bit deeper. Y'all ready? Oh man. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. The Bible starts at the beginning. And in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, God makes this statement. God saw the intention of the thoughts of man's heart were evil continually. That's not a physical heart. It's a spiritual heart. Are you with me on that? That's Genesis. But if you were to go with me to Revelation chapter 2, verse 23, Jesus speaking to the churches says this, And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. And I will give each of you according to your works. From beginning to end, the Bible says, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit is who searches the heart. He doesn't stop. He searches the heart all throughout the scripture. And all in between, the Lord talks about the heart and what and how and why we need a heart like God's. Because God's heart is pure. You wonder why we always say, hey, I want to be more like God. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because there is nothing deceitful in them. There is nothing unclean in them. Everything that they have is pure. Nothing is defiled in them. And so what we do as a people that are defiled, we call out to the one that's not. And we say, Lord, would you touch me? Would you help me? Would you strengthen me? All throughout scripture, the heart of the problem. Let me say it again. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. 
Now, just going back for just a moment, Matthew chapter 15, verse 19. Can I just pull out just a little bit of what Jesus is speaking on here? You see, the church had a problem back in the day. Did you realize churches ain't changed much? You know why? Because it's made up of people. <laughs> Some of y'all didn't think it was funny, but you will. <laughs> you will. It's made up of people. Church had not changed any. But yet this is what he says. The very last one there in verse 9. Now I'm getting to the, the whole heart of the problem here. Purity, right? Here's what I'm getting to. The end of verse 19, he says a word. You know what he says? Remember that? Remember that word that I said? He said slander. And you know where it came from? He said out of the heart. Slander comes out of the heart. Oh, now, brother, wait. No, 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 no. That's it. No, that's it. Well, hang on just a second. Just let me get it. Here's the definition. You ready for the definition of slander? All right? Here it goes. Whoo. The action or crime of making a false spoken statement damaging to a person's reputation. You want me to repeat? I'm going to repeat that real quick. The action or crime of making a false spoken statement damaging to a person's reputation. Can I just ask you just for a second? This morning, you're sitting in this service. Can I ask you a question? Here it is. Did you realize that it is possible to slander Jesus Christ? Wow. Right, so you got to think about this for a second. Did you hear what I said? Did you realize it is possible to slander the Messiah of the world? Oh, man. Can I say it like this? Synonym of slander. You, you can kind of say it in maybe this way. Maybe this will be easier to grab hold of. Did you realize that you can assassinate Jesus' character? Ooh, by the way, we still ain't got there, so now is the time to leave if, if you think that ain't ending. Did you realize that you can defame, that you can damage Jesus' character? You say, no, 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 he's perfect. We can't do that. But the problem is this. By being a hypocrite, it is so easy. You know how you're a hypocrite? Here's how we're hypocrites sometimes. We tell our children they need to pray and read the Bible, and we never do it. You're a hypocrite. Oh, man. I don't like that. We tell our children how important church is and everything else that goes along with that, and we don't attend. That's a hypocrite. And our children grow up, and what do they become? They become little hypocrites because all they're going to do is imitate the family. Ah, and until Jesus, listen to me. See, there's an aspect of a pure heart. That all of a sudden, it really breaks all of us down. Listen to me, pastor included. It breaks us all down when we start talking about this purity of heart. Who's going to see God? The pure in heart. The pure in heart. <laughs> the pure in heart. What's hypocritical? Hypocritical is walk into church like you've been preparing all week and you really ain't done anything. You're a hypocrite. What's hypocritical? Go to your Sunday school class as the teacher and act like you prepared and all you put was about five minutes into it. You know what? You are a hypocrite. Oh, I know. See, I told you it was going to get. But can I tell you something? Unless we deal with the issue of when we're dealing with purity of heart, then guess what? Can anybody make it? If all we do is sit back and say, no, I'll just do what you want to. Can I tell you, if you re were to read the book of Kings... You will realize people's already tried that. They sat back and the Bible says this. And they did what was right in their own eyes. And I want you to understand something. Not once, not ever, nor will it ever, did anything ever turn out good. 
When we begin to do things in our own eyes, what we think is right, it's only going to spell disaster. It will spell disaster for you, number one. It will spell disaster for your family, number two. And it will spell disaster for the church, number three. I already told you. <laughs> Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Can I read out of the book of Jude? Can I read that? Man, there is a book of Jude. <laughs> book of Jude, verse 24 says this. Oh, man, this is what I get. Oh. Did you know what a hypocrite is? It's someone who says they believe the Bible, but they don't act on it. You're a hypocrite. Man. Come on, come on up. Come on up. Jude 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Wow. Did you just read, hear what I read? This is scripture, the word of God. Not Brother Dwayne. This is the word of God. Jude verse 24. God's word says that Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, God himself is able. Now listen to this. Is able to keep you from stumbling. Did y'all hear that? But now listen to what it says. And to present you blameless. You know what that word also means? Pure, uh-oh, pure before the presence of his glory with great joy. If you don't believe that God can work in the lives of children in this church, you're a hypocrite. If you don't believe that God can transform our teenagers into something amazing, you're a hypocrite. If you don't believe that God can take the vilest sinner and transform their life like no other time, then you're a hypocrite. It is impossible to read the word of God and call yourself a Christian and not believe what it truly says. You're a hypocrite if you do that. May I not be found as your pastor allowing you to be a hypocrite. May I not be found as your pastor allowing you to slander the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. May I as your pastor not be one who is so afraid to back down because your feelings may be hurt and I may lose my job and I won't have pay. May I not be that person or that pastor, but may I stand upon the word of God and may I directly look at you out of so much love and may I say, no, I'm sorry, that's not right. You do with it what you want to. I'm just telling you what the word of God says. You know why? Because just a hope so don't get you to heaven. Just a time to come to the altar don't get you to heaven. Just because you think you're okay doesn't get you to heaven. Just because you believe you're doing the best you can won't get you to heaven. Your best will never get you anywhere. Unless you let God do something in your life, you will fall flat on your face time and time and time and time. You know how I know? Because I did it. See, here's the thing. You can try to argue with a lot of things, but you can't argue what happened in my life because I'm the one that lived it. Right? Come on. I'm telling you from experience. The reason I'm so adamant about the Word of God is because I know it transformed me. 
The reason I'm willing to preach it the way that I preach it is because it transformed me. And he called me to be the pastor of this church. He didn't call me to be a puppet on a string. And if you think that you can pull my string and I'll do what you want to, you've got another thing coming as a church. I will only abide by this. And anything else that anyone else says they think is okay, then guess what? Not happening. Not with me here. Not as the pastor of this church. I refuse to stand for the Lord on judgment day and him look at me and say, uh-uh, you're not pure. Uh, no, you didn't tell them the truth. You didn't, oh, yeah, I know it was going to be a hard message, Brother Dwayne, but I asked you to preach it. How come you weren't willing to preach it? Well, I was more worried about the people than I were of you. Many people have said that, and can I tell you, there's many people that have split hell wide open, and one day they're going to stand before God Almighty, and He's going to say, why didn't you? And the only thing that they'll be able to say is, yeah, it's all my fault. Nobody else made me do it. Can I tell you, you could pull out a gun right now, but you all can't force me to do anything that I don't want to do, even with a gun. Oh, come on. Well, we're putting the situation. No, no, here's the thing. God's in control. We trust Him. Right? Do you trust him? You're going to receive what he's wanting to do? You're going to receive that he's going to take care of you? Are you going to receive? Listen to me. Are you truly going to receive as a believer of Jesus Christ that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? Not just because of a natural death, but because somebody breaks into your home? Because somebody hits you on the road? Oh, come on. I say, now we got to think about these things. Do you believe the word of God? Because only the pure in heart are going to be there, is what the scripture says. Only the ones who truly believe what he is saying. Only the ones who have stepped out in faith to say, you know what, this is what, I, man, that is purity of heart. Which is to say this, I'm going to abide by the word of God. And you're saying, well, Brother Dwayne, it is just, it's so thick. How am I going to be able to get through it all? Number one, by not being a hypocrite. And putting your Bible out on the table when the pastor comes over and yet you ain't opened it for a month. But number two, by being dedicated to the Word of God. And you read it. Can I tell you something? You ain't going to read it in one day. <laughs> but what you do read will change your life. You know why? Because it's living, it's breathing, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And so the words that I read on here, I read it so as it will change my life. Blessed are the pure in heart. Not wishful thinking, not good motives. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Can I ask you this morning? Say, Brother Dwayne, man, this is a tough altar call. Yeah? But I'd rather it be a tough altar call and make it to heaven because I was willing to accept it than to say it was a tough altar call and split hell wide open because my pride got in the way. What about it this morning? I'll just read any of the scripture, read any of it through there. Read some of Paul's writings. Right? Don't go after the flesh. You know why? Because the flesh is not pure in heart. Pure in heart is when you go after the spirit, right? The fruit of the spirit. What he wants to do in our lives, that's when purity comes in. And he begins to touch us and to speak to us. I want you to understand something. The older we get... We shouldn't have less convictions. We should have more. So if you start out with convictions, let's say you don't get saved till you're 20. And all of a sudden God shows you some things and man, you've got some convictions. By the time that you're 40, 60, and 80, they should be a lot more. Listen to me. Being wise as you get older doesn't mean that you back away from the word of God. It means that you love it even more. So much so that you look at people and say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Well, why is that? Because, well, the Lord spoke to me on it. You, you do what you need to do, but I'm just telling you, this is what the Lord spoke to me. And I'm going to hold to it. 
You know what that is? Purity of heart. Purity of heart is when God speaks to you individually. Not somebody else. Not somebody else. Listen to me. God ain't going to speak to me and say, come over here. I need you to purify his heart. No. God's speaking to him, just like he's speaking to all of you all. But I want you to know God moves in, and he begins to speak to us, and what he speaks to you may not may be different than what, I, what he's dealing with me about. You know why? Because he knows what's going to help you, and he knows what's going to help me. And he comes in, and he speaks to us, and he says, Are you willing, are you willing to do this? No, they don't look the same right now, but they still glorify me. Are you willing to do that? You know what that is? Purity of heart. And the pure in heart are who will see God. Not just because you wear the name tag around don't do anything for you. What about it this morning? 